evening as we worship our Lord. Let's stand to sing our hymn of invocation. Tis not I that chose, Lord, tis not I that choose, that choose thee. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our worship continues as we speak responsibly to intro it. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with the beauty. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my day.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let me see. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. According to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they wouldn't come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, Church of God, Elect and Glorious.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There used to be an ad campaign for the peanut butter company Jif. And they would always say that choosy moms choose Jif. You remember that? Choosy moms choose Jif. Especially crunchy peanut butter in my case, but be that as it may. I thought of that this week because what we have is a choosy God. We have a choosy God. Throughout the scriptures, we see how God is in the business of choosing his people, of picking out his peculiar people. We see it in the Old Testament, for instance, when he calls Abram. He calls Abram out of Ur and says, you are going to be my people. You're going to be the, the father of many nations. Those nations subsequently, the people of Israel, you are my chosen people. God chooses Moses and says, yes, you are the one who is going to lead my people. He's a very choosy God. We see it continuing in the New Testament through the ministry of our Lord Jesus. You think of, uh, for instance, in John 15, Jesus is talking with the apostles and he says, Look guys, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And then finally we get to our gospel reading today and Jesus says that the bottom line of this parable that he shares is this. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. A few are chosen. And if you're like me, maybe you hear words like that, and it's a little bit distressing. Because you say, okay, Lord, many are called, few are chosen. That's all well and good, so long as I'm one that you're choosing. It might lead us to a place where we're wondering about that. The fancy biblical term that's used for this is election. Or sometimes people talk about predestination. God choosing people for salvation. Whoo, there's a hotbed. You say, well, what do we do with this? How do we, how do we figure this out? And some people settle it right away and say, well, it's not so much that Jesus chooses us, it's that we choose him. It's up to us. The ball is in our court. Yeah, Jesus says this stuff, but no, at the end of the day, it's really up to us. Friends, I'm here to tell you that is not the case. God is the choosy God. It is not up to you and me whether or not we will choose him. Maybe you remember those words from the small catechism. When the small catechism it says, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Christ Jesus my Lord or come to him. If it's up to me, I'm always going to choose against God. Choosing him is not like choosing peanut butter or cereal off the rack. This kind of election, this kind of choosing can only be done by him of us. But again, if that's the case, how do you know? How can you and I be certain and sure that we are among those whom God has chosen? We have a choosy God. How do I know that I'm one that he chooses? That's the question that I want to unpack this evening. I know it's a big one. Let's see how you can do it in 15 minutes, right? But to think about it, to, to ponder this such important question, Raised by Jesus' own words, many are called, but few are chosen. How do you know that you are one of the chosen? Well, one answer that's given is not the most reassuring one, but it's an answer nevertheless. That answer is, you can't know. <laughs> you don't know if you are among those who are chosen. In this lifetime, nobody knows. It feels like a little bit of a roulette wheel. Maybe you're chosen, maybe you're not, but in any event, you can't know. And as distressing as that response might be, there's actually something to be said for it. I mean, you can just go to our gospel reading here in the, in the parable that Jesus tells, where we see that our king is a mysterious king. And if you think that you've got him cornered, if you think that you've got Jesus all figured out, he's going to wheel around on you and say something that is going to absolutely put you back on your heels. And that happens in this story here, where Jesus, he, he tells the parable, and he, the father is preparing a wedding feast, the king is preparing a wedding feast for his son. All he wants is a, a full hall, and he can't seem to get it, until finally he's bringing in anybody and everybody, just go out into the road, bring them all in. Is this how Caitlin is organizing the wedding next week? No. <laughs> Not exactly. Anybody, everybody, bad, good, evil, doesn't matter. We just want anybody we can to come into this wedding feast. That seems to be the, the focus of this king. Say, oh, that's great. What grace, what kindness. But then one guy comes up, 
and he is just he is enjoying that amazing grace you know he's eating all of the hors d'oeuvres at the wedding feast and just making the most of it and the king says hey where's your wedding garment <laughs> yeah I didn't bring one didn't bother and he binds him hand and foot and throws him out that is not the direction you were expecting the story to go at that point right this is a mysterious king there's something to be said if we say, well, you know what? You just can't know in this lifetime if you are one of those who is chosen. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He doesn't make us privy to look behind the curtain on the heavenly council on each and every decision of this. And yet, and yet God is very clear throughout the scriptures that while his ways might be mysterious, that he has not spoken in secret, that you do not search him in vain. And furthermore, that God's desire, his deepest heart's desire, is that all people, all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Those don't sound like the words of a God who just wants everybody to be in the dark and be wondering, am I among those who are chosen? And so we need to reject this first answer to the question, how do we know? If we would say, well, you just can't know in this lifetime. Yeah, that, there's something to be said for that, but ultimately that is not the case. That is not the case. God doesn't want us to play guess who when it comes to our chosenness and our election. So then what? How do we know that we are chosen? There's a second answer that's given. Remember, Socrates famously said that the unexamined life is not worth living the second answer is, you know, we need to examine our life, examine the fruits of your life, and see whether or not those fruits line up with a person who has been chosen, who is among those who are saved. And even more than that first answer, this one has something going for it. Biblically, Jesus says, by your fruits you shall know them. Does he not? Or again, you turn to that, that parable, the gospel story that Jesus tells and you have all of those guys who had been invited, all of those who had been called. And yet one after another, they turn away from the king's servants. They presume on him. He says, hey guys, everything is ready. Come in. And they think, ah, not so much. The game is on, you know. Maybe I can come later. You mind if I come late? Is that right if I crash the party just on my schedule? There are people whose lives show that they do not believe in this king. They did not belong at the party. In that sense, they have already demonstrated by their fruit, by their rotten fruit, that evidently they are not among those who are chosen. There's something to this. I mean, James, Lutherans aren't always real big on the letter of James, but did James not say, faith without works is what? Dead. Faith indubitably brings forth the fruit of faith even as a healthy tree, is going to bring forth fruit. That's true. And again, as Lutherans, sometimes I love to rag on Lutherans. I am one. Sometimes we focus so much on grace that we forget about the necessity of works, that works necessarily follow from a living and active faith. That's true. However, it's a different question to ask. Are our works the grounds of our acceptance? Or even, are our works the grounds on which you and I can be certain that we are chosen by God? I mean, if that's the question, consider just oh, one of the famous writers of the Bible. Think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is the one who called himself the chief of what? Sinners. The chief of sinners. Paul, where's your fruits? We want to see if, they, if you're chosen. He's the chief of sinners. He says elsewhere, wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul, hey, man, listen, ease up a little bit. If you think you're going to be among the chosen, shouldn't you have a little bit more fruit to show for it? But listen, God chooses people. He chooses people irrespective of our fruits by grace. And I dare say that one of the primary fruits of faith is a humility that doesn't go around looking like, hey, Check this out. You want to see my fruits? Should we do a little fruit comparison? One of the principal fruits of faith is recognizing your fruit isn't as, your fruit isn't as good as you thought that it was. Does that make sense? 
so that we end up like Paul recognizing, oh, I thought I was so good until I met Jesus. And now I realize my fruit is lacking, that my works are wanting, and yet still, in His grace and mercy, He has accepted me. No, I don't deserve to be among the elect. I have no business being invited to that wedding feast, and yet here we are. He has called and invited me into that feast. He went and got both the good and the evil. So while, yes, our faith, our living faith, does necessarily bring forth the fruits of faith, that's not the, the basis of our call, and it's not even how you can be certain and know that you are one whom He has chosen. If that's the basis of your certainty and your confidence, you'll be building a quicksand, I can promise you that. So we need to reject that second answer as well. How do I know that I am one who has chosen? It's not that, oh, you just can't know. Nor is it merely by evaluating, looking at all of your fruit in your life, the works of your life. That isn't going to give you a, a certain answer either. So then what? Friends, I submit to you that the only way that you and I can know and be certain in this life that you are one who has chosen is to look to the host. Look to the host and listen to his word to you. I heard a story about a poet, a guy by the name of W.H. Auden. He's a British poet in the 20th century. He was a big deal in England in the last century. And as part of his role and his status as this important literature guy, he would often be called upon to throw parties. Big swank soirees, all the literati would come to these parties. He hated doing it. He hated doing it. But I heard the story of a, of a guy who, when he was young, his uh, friend got invited to one of these parties of W.H. Auden. Now, he himself was not somebody who had any business going to something like this. He was um, a blue-collar guy. He didn't know W.H. Auden from anybody else. And yet, here he was, going to this party. He felt totally out of place. As soon as he gets there, his friend leaves him high and dry, goes, checks out the hors d'oeuvres, what have you. And there he is, in the corner, feeling like, he, he, what am I doing here? He's looking around, and I don't belong here. And in so many ways, he was right. From across the room, W.H. Auden, the big deal guy, the one who was throwing the party, he sees this poor chap hanging out in the corner all by himself, and he strides across the room, and he says to him, I'm so glad that you're here. He says, sir, I, I don't feel like I belong here. I've got no business being here. He's like, yeah, I, don't, I feel that way too. But you're here, and you can be certain that you belong, because I'm talking to you right now. you and I can be certain that we belong at the party because Christ Jesus says so. Because he is the host of the party. And he says to you and me, come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. We have the Savior, we have the Lord who looks to you and me and says, come, you are one of mine. Receive these gifts. Come to this party. Hear it. Believe it. And so that it will be unmistakable the king himself has clothed you with the garments of salvation in holy baptism. He doesn't want you guessing. He doesn't want you doubting. You say, Lord, but yeah, I'm not so sure today when I look at my fruits, I, I'm wondering how I'm doing. He says, well, don't, let, look at me here. I have clothed you with my gifts. I have made you my own in holy baptism. You belong. You are mine. Yeah, you might be evil. Yeah, you might be good. Doesn't matter. You are forgiven. You've been chosen by me. That's what matters. And I'll go further still. That same Lord has called and ordained me, put me here as his servant to tell you tonight, you are among the chosen. Ah, pastor, I don't know. I'm not sure I can believe it. Doggone it. Listen here, folks. You are chosen. And we celebrate these gifts tonight as a foretaste of the wedding feast to come. Look to the host. Look to the broken body of your Savior who says, This is my body broken for you. Receive his blood into your very body so that you would know without any doubt his blood has been shed for you. You are among the chosen. You have been not only invited and called, but welcomed in. 
Our God is a choosy God. And know this and be sure of it. He chooses you. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand for prayer. And in the prayers of the church this week, in addition to those who are named in the back of your worship folder, we pray for uh, Kathleen Parsons, who's going to be undergoing surgery soon down in Nashville. Uh, we also are graced this evening with little Fierro Arturo Morano. Uh, I'm assuming he's, that's what you're holding there, not your teddy bear. Okay, very good. And so we continue prayers for, yeah, we continue prayers for Fierro and for Mom and for all the family. It's so good to see you guys. God bless you. We look forward to uh, Fierro's baptism very soon. And... Uh, in addition, do we have any other prayer requests this evening? Anyone celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week? Sandy, it's your birthday this week? Anniversary. Okay, for Sandy and Roger Anderson. Very good. I neglected to mention it's also Pat Leagy's birthday this week. Suzanne Donlin, Don and Deb Dinkmeyer's anniversary. For Richard Kinnunen, William Kinnunen, their birthdays. For Yo Yolanda Leno, who's celebrating a birthday this week. And for Charity Dahmers as well. And as I mentioned before, we'll also pray for Caitlin and Dallas as we look forward to their wedding on Saturday. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs, saying, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For grace, that we may hear and heed the invitation of our Lord, and joyfully wear the baptismal clothing of his righteousness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a welcoming spirit in our congregation, for boldness in our invitation to those without a church home, and for a willingness to serve our neighbor in need and the stranger whose lives cross our paths, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For compassion toward the sick and those who suffer, for our care of those who need our assistance, for the hospitalized and for those who are recovering. We remember before the Lord, especially little Fierro and for Callie and for the family. We also pray for Caitlin and Dallas as they prepare for their wedding day. We pray for Kathleen. She's about to undergo surgery this week. And for all those who we name in our hearts now. That God grant them healing comfort, strength, and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all elected and appointed civil servants, for all judges and magistrates, for all emergency personnel, for all members of the armed forces, and for all of us as citizens and neighbors, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the dawn of God's eternal day, for an end to death and sorrow, for the comfort of those who grieve, and for the strength of those who are facing death, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And for those who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, for Sandy and Roger, for Don and Deb, uh, and also for those celebrating birthdays, Pat and Suzanne, Richard, William, Yolan, and Charity, that all of these would have grateful hearts and give thanks to God for every good and perfect gift, and most especially that of life and marriage. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, everlasting Father, Almighty God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. to sing the note to Metis. give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing for our sending hymn, Almighty Father, bless the word.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.